I'm going to introduce our next keynote for this afternoon. So our next speaker is Professor Cindy Katz. I had the pleasure of working with Professor Katz last year when she was the Diane Middlebrook and Carl Gerasi Visiting Professor of Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge. Cindy Katz is Professor of Geography and Environmental Psychology and Women's Studies at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Her work has been extremely influential in this field. She has published widely on social reproduction and the production of space, place, and nature, children and the environment, and the consequences of global economic restructuring for everyday life. Her book, Growing Up Global, Economic Restructuring and Children's Everyday Lives, received the 2004 Meridian Book Award for Outstanding Scholarly Work in Geography. I'm so thrilled that she was able to join us at this year's Global Scholar Symposium. Please help me in welcoming Professor Cindy Katz. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, this is an honor. I want to thank the organizing committee and Katie Hammond, there's a lot of Katie's, um, for inviting me. It's, it is a pleasure and, an, and I really do mean it's an honor and of course I didn't ask how this works. <laughs> not one of my skills, but we'll see. Um, and it's uh, 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 daunting. Never follow the Dalai Lama. <laughs> That's a little scary. Um, but it's a daunting, um, it's also daunting to follow Grass and Mich Michelle and Sean in, in talking about development. And my uh, talk, I think, segues into some of the concerns that were raised. So um, yesterday, Gordon Campbell, was talking about the, the wonders of progress and, and, and people's capacity. And one of the things he mentioned was going to the moon as a, as a major feat. And so just a little story as an as a entry point and a, a metaphor for what I'm going to talk about. When I was in this village where I lived in rural Sudan doing research a million years ago, um, one of the elders of the village kind of stood up when I was first going to his house to introduce myself, and he, oh, you're from America. Yes, I really am I proud of that fact, but yes, I am. But, and then he said, you're the people who went to the moon. Yes, we are. And, and then he said, and all you brought back was rocks. <laughs> and it's true. So this is a parable of not bringing back rocks. Um, although I understand those rocks were a source of scientific <laughs> interest. Um, but I want to talk about development in an expanded field. And by expanded field, I mean a temporal field and a spatial field. So that temporal is, is to have a multi and intergenerational notion of development. And spatial, that the ideas about inv that investment and accumulation and dispossession um, are all, always traverse scale, and they always cross place and space. And so do their effects. So that it means to situate development um, it alters the standard metrics of accountability. From, of development. Development funders and development programs are often have, want to see results in two to three years. And they're not very clear at all times about what results are, but they sort of pack up and go after that time frame. Um, and to think about a kind of static time frame, and I, and I will illustrate this, is to not really think of what development that deserves the name development means. So I want to really um, make us aware of that expanded field. As I mentioned, this, this work, all right, let's see if I could do this. Hello, tech man. <laughs> what? Point it, don't point it at my stomach. <laughs> I'm learning every day. Um, okay, what is social reproduction? I've, and because um, that is the focus of almost all of my work. Social reproduction is about making a way to make the future. It is about 
producing a differentiated labor force, a labor force that has a range of skills and knowledge and talents that, it, that is reproduced on a daily basis and over the long term, over generations. It's also about reproducing the conditions of production, the material grounds of production, not just the um, mechanics of it, but the environment. So that if we destroy the environment in the course of production, we, d we stymie the fact of there being um, a, a capacity to keep producing, keep working, keep playing, keep making a world that is habitable. So I, all of my work, in one way or another, looks at these practices associated with, re, with social reproduction. And as I mentioned, I need him. What do I point at? I'm so low tech. So when you want to go forward, press that one. That yeah. one? That's the one, yeah. That is me, proof I was in the field. Um, this was. As I mentioned, a study done a, a number of years ago, and, and let me say in, in um, semi-passing that this work that I did in, in rural Sudan um, had a counterpart to, to doing work in New York City about the questions of de-skilling and knowledge and, and work, and, and I tried to make an argument, I made an argument about something happening to children in rural Africa and urban U uh, USA that was comparable, not the same, but had an analytic um, connections in that the things they were learning in their childhoods were not necessarily going to help them in their adulthoods. And so this is not just a story about someplace else and what happened to them, but a story about a way to understand global economic restructuring or what's sort of glibly said as globalization. And my current work is about um, the anxiety and insecurity of the political economic and political ecological future and what that does in terms of investing in particular children and childhoods, children as accumulation strategies and children as waste. And tonight in the fireside chat, I could, you know, this, this kind of circles around to that. And that is, is relevant to everyone in this room. Um, so it's, it, and I think, it, I'm sorry, but my plane was late, but I understand that you talked about those sorts of hyper investments in certain people. What, how do you have any sort of equity or e equality when we have uh, certain children and childhoods that are valued at the expense of social childhood, which is other people's children, and those kinds of inequalities keep expanding. And this, that the genesis of those concerns happened here. Um, so this was a, a, an ethnographic study of children's environmental learning and knowledge and interactions. And I did this, this is now quite an old map because now this is two countries, but it was right along the Dinder River in, in what is now, well, what, is, what was then Sudan, but is now a different Sudan, which is the northern Arabic-speaking Islamic Sudan. And this was an area of dry land cultivation um, of sorghum and a little bit of sesame. It was um, a subsistence economy based on growing sorghum, the main food. The little bit of cash people needed was, was what they got from either animal, animal husbandry or, or the sale of sesame. There was agroforestry and, as I mentioned, animal husbandry. In 1971, an agricultural project was established, the Suki Project, um, and in the immediate vicinity of this village, 2,500 acres were leveled and cleared and planted in, and, and uh, made into 10-acre farm tenancies. And there were 250 tenancies in the vicinity of the village, and um, they were um, farmers, tenant farmers, were growing cotton and ground nuts for the world market. And there was no, no sorghum grown 
There was a real change in the ecology, the environment around the village, so that um, uh, the grazing areas and the agroforestry areas were compromised. Um, the idea was, and this is a standard issue development project. Um, it, there was nothing diabolical about it. There was nothing fabulous about it. It was just something intended to um, transform a local economy, a local subsistence economy, bring people in that area into the world market in a more fundamentally integrated, cash-oriented way, and produce crops uh, for sale. Um, the effects, however, were quite different than anticipated, and this is partly why I am um, arguing for an expanded field of understanding what development is. The effects were uh, on gendered household labor were that initially agricultural labor was intensified. The work of growing cotton and groundnuts in 100% rotation in an irrigated, uh, of, in irrigated fields meant clearing irrigation ditches, applying fertilizer several times, um, using pesticides, having particular kinds of tools that were not the customary tools, um, having a set number of weedings, and having the work regime dictated by the managers of the agricultural project and not by the local population. Um, the, by clearing this area that had been in mixed land use, so that where there had been woods, pastures, fields, and fallowing of the fields so that pasture and, and wooded areas grew, there was now set determined boundaries and far less um, wood and pasture areas near the village. Um, that increased uh, the time it took to graze animals, that increased the time it took to get poorer and poorer quality of firewood, and um, that also increased children's time. By integrating the area into the, the global, national, and regional economy more firmly, and I'm not at all saying that these people were outside of capitalism before or outside of the world economy, but their connections to it were rather different and on different terms. As the area became more and more integrated into that economy, things that had been freely available or collectively um, held were turned into, became commodities. They got a price. People needed cash to buy firewood. You needed money to, to pay for agricultural labor because the, the work required was not something the family could do on its own. And so um, all of these things, the degradation, degradation of land, degrade, degradation of land, the um, increased time of grazing, the need for cash, all led to increases in children's labor time. So if your idea of, quote, development would be increased schooling or school attendance, increased education in a formal sense, that's not what happened. In fact, school enrollments, uh, Actually, what matters more than school enrollment is school attendance, but both decreased in, in, in the wake of this project. Make sure I see. Oh, I guess I could see it here, like a, like a truly modern person. Um, so I just show if you, that's the kind of firewood that people were using within, um, 15 years of the project being established. That, even if you've never built your own fire to cook, you probably know that's not great firewood. Um, and so I want to think about the intergenerational effects of um, this, this development project. The way that um, the, the, the thing, one of the things that struck me in this project was how well children were learning to do the work of their community, to learn to farm, to learn uh, to use local resources, uh, uh, wood and far, forest resources and um, grazing resources, and how all of that was sort of under erasure. So that 
they were learning to be tenant farmers, but not likely to become tenant farmers. In part, this has to do with simple demographics. Um, at the outset of the project, they distributed, the project authorities distributed 250 tenancies to the population, uh, to the to village. There were already more than 250 houses. The average number of children in a household was five, um, and the average age of marriage uh, um, and childbearing was under 20 years old. So you, I, you're all the brilliant scholars of, of the tomorrow and today. You could do the math. That's a lot. That, for those of you who think that 40 is retirement age, think again. So that parents would be 40 and have a 20-year-old child who also needed to have a livelihood. And all, so the number of the access to productive resources within the village was um, diminishing as the, as the population was increasing. And this is not a problem of population growth or overpopulation, it's a, pro pro it's a problem of resource distribution and access to productive resources. Um, so that, as I said, people were using um, Resor um, learning to use resources that were no longer going to be available. That used to be a completely heavily forested um, riverbank. So I, when I say that there was, um, the, the local environment was re, uh, re restructured um, or devegetated or deteriorated, I mean something quite stark. Um, and that is pictorial evidence of this. So the consequences of agricultural development, and let me say that every time I think and say development, it's in scare quotes, um, but I don't want to constantly go like this, um, is, is what, uh, what we can think of as the four Ds. There was dispossession, devegetation, degradation and displacement from this area for all the reasons I've, I've cited. And I'm not going to say, and it's your job to save the future. I want to have some glimmers of the ways that people who were affected directly by these four Ds coped with it and responded to it themselves. But these are not uncommon effects of the sorts of standard development projects that um, international organizations, bilateral aid uh, organizations, um, effect. And it's not the intent of it, but it is the outcome of a lot of these projects. So, the four Ds have, in response, something that I call the three Rs, different than the reading, writing, and arithmetic of the three Rs. I don't know if that's just an American thing. But there, and, and this I, ha I discuss kind of at, at length in um, Growing Up Global. But I think that this is an interesting, th th and I actually talk about it um, in relation to theorizing resistance. So that people, um, especially in my generation, uh, were critical Marxist, radical uh, development um, researchers and cultural studies scholars were always looking for and finding resistance. But resistance started to be kind of anything you could do autonomously. Like you watch TV in your own way, and that's somehow resisting the power of cultural media. And while I do believe intensely in the autonomous response, and I don't have a kind of knee-jerk idea about the power of any form of media to overcome us. Um, I do want to say that I thought that resistance was becoming um, watered down and un un an unuseful idea. And so I wanted to parse it a bit and think about what, what is, enables resistance to 
these forces that are increasing inequality, that are leading to these sorts of dispossessions latched to accumulations elsewhere. What, what is it that enables um, resistance that deserves the name, in other words? So one thing I saw that was, and so I, the parsing is resi to say resilience, reworking, and resistance. Resilience um, is something that I saw in a, in a quite amazing way. I went back to this village over a period of um, more than 15 years. And when I went back, um, I expected, having worked intensely with 10-year-olds um, who, for a year there, who, who then I tried to find all of them uh, 15 years later, and did, um, it, it, which was also great. Um, but I expected, having theorized like this, they're learning to use an environment under erasure, they will all have been erased from that landscape. They will all be in the city. The city is not set up in, to absorb them in any way, and they didn't have the skills that they needed. They didn't, weren't in school learning literacy and numeracy. They were learning how to use the uh, rural environment. Um, this, the economy of Sudan, the political economy of Sudan, is one that is undermined, uh, like eaten alive by civil war and now by by war. Um, civil has been removed from the title because now it's two countries. Um, but it is a, an economy that was eating itself. So even if it had been um, developing, it would have been difficult to absorb these children who are just one village worth of children but are um, uh, emblematic of, of the nation's problems. So when I went back, what I found was that most of them still lived in or near the village, but they were doing what they did before, which was agriculture, animal husbandry, and forestry, but they went 50 kilometers to um, find agricultural work. They went and grazed animals 100 kilometers away from their village, and they were cutting wood to make charcoal for sale 250 kilometers for the, from their village. So they were doing the same mix of things in an area that was 1,500 times the size of what they had done before. This is one of my only quantitative things I've ever been able to say or do, and I, tried, I did the math over and over again, and it's true. Um, so you're just gonna have to trust me on that. But um, to be able, so the idea that in order to stay in place, the place has to become 1,500 times larger is a profound thing, and yet enabled them to stay in place. They did this, nobody helped them, they, they did this by, by, the, by their own labor and their own needs and their own availability, they're, but again, they're not the only village who is using these resources. So if everyone is expanding by 1,500 um, times, that's going to bump into, they're, they're bumping into people in, the, in those woods. Um, but I want to talk about this for one more minute, because uh, uh, I call it time-space expansion. The um, well-known geographer, David Harvey, has the notion of time-space compression. Time-space compression is familiar to every one of us in this room, whether uh, we know the term or not. It is how technology enables us to be in the world in a more connected, more easily connected, and faster connection. So jets, internet, iPhones, you name it. We, and now we are just like connected in the, in the deepest, fastest, most tight way. You could all be sitting here not listening to me and talking to someone in your own countries and nobody would even know, although I'm peeking around. Um, so that's time-space compression and that has a kind of intuitive logic. What I argue with Harvey is that that's how it is for people in power. 
But the fallout of time-space compression is time-space expansion. If you are poor, or you are the part of the dispossessed, the, where the accumulation has taken resources from your area, then time-space compression leads to attenuated w work times, attenuated commutes, attenuated areas in which you need to go to get the resources you need just to, to reproduce your everyday life, not to necessarily advance. So that to insist on time-space expansion is an important counter force and counter argument to the kind of glib notion of globalization as we are all together fast, easy, um, all the time. Okay, that's resilience. Reworking was something that also was quite profound. With self-help projects um, and some outside assistance, these stand pipes were uh, from the Irish NGO concern, um, but, but through enormous efforts of, of self-help in this village, which came from the sugar co-op. They got sugar from the government and sold it Oh, I have a second, a second quantitative thing. 93,000 pounds of sugar produced pipes throughout the village. Um, and now it's too, I, I don't actually, I'm throwing that number out because I know that was the number, but I can't remember. I think that was what was purchased in a year. But from this money, the people in the village did not build a school at first. They built water pipes, because girls are doing the labor of, of fetching water. It's an Islamic area. The pre preference is that women are not working outside of their house yards, so that a lot of the work that elsewhere in the global south is done by women was done by children in this area, so fetching water, getting wood, all of that work was, uh, was children's work. And so if you want girls um, schooling to increase, it's not enough to build a school and then criticize people for not sending their daughters. You have to build the means for girls to attend school. So that was one of the things that was done. I lied when I said I only had one piece of financial data. Okay, so school, girls, when I was there the first time, 4% of the girls were in school. 4% of the girls 7 to 12 years old were in school. And when I went back 15 years later, that it had increased to 42% of the girls 12, 7 to 12. In one generation, this is not staying still in the face of these sorts of changes. And 75% more boys were in school. That, to me, is a profound change in the relationship to schooling and to education. What, whether having gone to school makes a difference, and it, will, it always makes a difference, but whether it allows them to succeed in the new political economy is a different question. But it is a retooling that is initiated by people in the village, people who did not think it was appropriate for girls to study with boys, people who were kind of dismissive of formal schooling, government schooling, people who, when, when I was there the first time, there was one person who had ever gone to university and he walked around like a prince and everybody else thought he was sort of useless. Um, and so, and all of us are extra useless, um, so that that reworked idea of education and retooling of a place around education um, suggests rather rapid understanding and response to so-called development. Finally, there was resistance, but it wasn't around social reproduction per se. It was around food security, though that's about social reproduction at some level. People returned to sorghum cultivation. The, farmer, the farm tenants actually went to the Ministry of Agriculture and petitioned to be able to grow sorghum on part of their tenancies, and they finally succeeded uh, to be able to grow the sorghum on their groundnut tenancies. It's a rather than the cotton, because the government makes the money from the cotton and the farmer makes the money or loses the money from the groundnuts. So that these 
um, three things, resilience, reworking, and resistance, are ways to make, as this, this slide says, a vibrant and um, survivable future. And the, their lessons that are from a community facing the consequences of development, it's not so hard not to just bring back rocks. Um, it, it takes some imagination. It takes learning from people who are in the throes of this, of this work. Um, it it, to think and do development in an expanded field requires us to really work the connections and contradictions between here and there. To rework those connections between accumulation and dispossession, between value and waste. Um, um, and, re and to reimagine shared time and space. And by shared time and space, I mean we to share the time and space of caring, of the planet, I know this is not overstating it, of nations, and households, and bodies. That means changing labor time and practices to ac ac um, accommodate more people. And this, this is where it segues um, into the sorts of work that I do now on um, childhood and the investment and disinvestments in particular children. Because we don't have, um, we don't, I refuse any argument that says we have overpopulation. We have it, maldistribution of resources. And one of the things I think is striking is to think that we have um, 19th century work rules and regulations and 21st century technologies. We are, we at least in the US still cling to a 40 hour work week and we have massive unemployment. Um, we have people who work two and three jobs just to make ends meet and we have people who can't find a job. Um, why do we have a fixed notion of how long a work week should be? Why can't we think, and this is not revolutionary, this is just accommodating more people, think about a 25 hour work week in the global north, which produces more, quote, disposable time, which is time to do nothing, the privilege of a good childhood. Um, this is one of my kind of standard things. That I was asked to once speak about what's a good childhood. A good childhood is where there's time to do nothing. Many of you got here by never doing nothing, I think, probably. Um, doing nothing is a privilege of the past, no doubt. But doing nothing, OK, you go out. I don't really care where you grew up. In some form or another, this is probably a standard thing. You go out, your parents, you come back in, your parents say, what'd you do? Where'd you go? Out. What'd you do? Nothing. <laughs> the whole world is happening in nothing. And we are encroaching on the time of doing nothing, which is creative time, which is the time to, to make the world new and different. The children in this village actually had time to do nothing. Sometimes their work and play were much more connected, um, even though I talked about the intensification of their t work and the increased time of it. They were playful in the ways they worked. They were unsupervised. They were not regulated. They weren't going from recreation, which is different than playing, um, and lessons. And so I'm segueing into something else, and I'm not going to really talk about that, but I want to say that these issues of accommodating more people in a productive life that is survivable and vibrant and interesting requires a better and different relationship between uh, work and play, disposable time and work time. Dis Marx himself said that in disposable time is where um, life happens and accumulation happens because that is actually is a time of consumption. But if you have time where you are painting, painting, punting, um, hiking, thinking, playing piano, you know, doing creative forms of nothing, other pe you have a, a richer life. It actually is that sort of um, old, if you've, the Dalai Lama didn't read this section of Capital, but where you 
paint in the morning, fish in the afternoon, work, I don't think it's in capital, I forget where it is. But that's like the ideal, is to have a more differentiated life. And that more differentiated life is what we're undermining with development, have undermined with overdevelopment, and, and is going to lead to greater inequality, actually, where people are dispossessed of the survivable futures when they could be more easily accommodated with some elementary changes. I'm not saying these are easy to do, but it's more than just shared jo job sharing. It's about reconfiguring the, the, the notion and the regulations and the, um, the um, um, compensation for for work. But questions of social reproduction are at the heart of these shifts of remaking the conditions of production and care for the environment and for one another and to increase reproductive um, capacity in all of its um, rich differentiated ways to remake the possibilities for work and play. Thank you. Questions All right, thank you so yeah. much, Cindy Katz, for that great discussion. So we're just actually going to start with some questions, but I would just ask that, and we keep this going for the rest of the conference, I think we lost it along the way, um, that you please stand up when you have a question, say your name, say where you're from, and if you could just say um, the program you're into, that would be great. So we'll start over here. Hello, my name is Ali Rizvi. I'm from Pakistan, and I'm studying engineering science. Uh, I just would like to uh, know more about your opinion of this culture of nothing that we have developed, and um, what should be our answer to it, so as to say, so that we can move away from a culture of nothing to a culture of something better. Well, okay. I think my um, sort of glib way of talking about nothing maybe was um, misconstrued. I, I was saying that, and this goes to the heart of current work that I'm doing, which is, like I said, about childhood, but it's really about parenting under contemporary conditions of anxiety about the future, is that children and the child, the not necessarily all children, of course, but the child has become a commodity, an accumulation strategy, an ornament, a way of making sure for middle class and privileged parents all over the world, not just in the global north, that your child makes it through the eye of the needle, which is becoming more and more narrow. And that requires a kind of packaging and I, and I know that many of you are the products of this packaging and that it takes its toll as well as has its, its phenomenal beauty. So I don't, I'm not criticizing you, but you certainly, nor your parents. I'm one of them. But I, so I'm not saying that is the problem, but the problem is this sense of precariousness about the future that leads not to a social, economic, political response about other people's children, which is a social childhood, but is about my child. I'm going to make sure that my child makes it because who knows what tomorrow is. And when you're only looking at my child, you then send your children to private schools and the public schools fall apart. You watch as privatization of public space takes place, and, and now I'm talking really about the US, where social welfare is, and social housing and social health care are diminished and where everything is much more in the neoliberal vein. As that happens, childhood, the nature of childhood changes, where it's so constricted and so kind of forced. There's, and there's lots of books and studies about the overworked child and the overprotected child and the, you know, the increase in homework and what that does. And I'm saying there's a part of not just children, but all people that need creative outlets, that need time to do nothing, that is not 
nothing, but is something very important that is where creativity happens, where your imagination runs free. And we're all on this treadmill at this point, and there's no one in this room who, who got here just from doing nothing. We got here and you know, from working really hard and being um, good at or considered successful at what we do, but, the, but in, there's a cost to that a social cost and a personal cost. And I'm saying that we need to open up what, what childhood, what we think about as childhood. And in, this, in the study that I talked about in Sudan, when I was early, when I did this field work with these 10-year-old children, which was a fabulous way to spend a year, let me say, um, their work, play, and learning were much more a unity. They worked while they played, they played while they worked, they worked playfully, and they also played workfully. They, you know, they um, made miniature charcoal mounds. You know, the kids who actually were, went out with their fathers to make charcoal mounds then made these miniature ones and made tiny bits of charcoal that they gave their mothers, and it was useful charcoal. So there was a way that what they did, you know, it wasn't like I'm playing teacher or doctor because that's what I want to be when I grow up. It's like I'm playing what I already do. Um, and so there was a lot of integration, but as their work increased, or at, and then when the next generation, when their schooling increased, those things start to get separated. And I, I know that I'm, I sound utopian, like let's go back to this unity of work, play, and um, learning, but I think the best learning takes place in that way, where, where your imagination is, is free to, and you're, you know, you're part of something that's not just about rote learning or about um, formal kind of recreation practices, but you're in, in the world and in a learning community, which is different than a classroom. So you, does that make sense? Um, we'll go with Sarah, <laughs> who's up just over here. Hello, my name is Sarah and um, I'm a Gates Scholar here at Cambridge. So just a follow up to this um, discussion that was uh, taking place. Um, when I, I, I have children, <laughs> one of the few people in the room who does, um, and so I really hear what you're saying about the importance of children's development taking place in structured time and especially unstructured time and how that's important for their development as people and also as members of community. Um, but I can't help but wonder whether unstructuring time for children to be able to have that creative space is possible in European and North American and other such societies where um, the economic arrangements we have put incredible pressure on parents under current conditions to allow children to have unstructured time would presume that there's somebody at home to ensure that they're safe while they're having their unstructured time. And if that's not the case, then um, we have to allocate the freedom of children to surrogate parents in the forms of daycare and other such things. I was wondering if you could maybe comment on what the implications are for healthier childhoods in the larger scope of our economic and social policies. Well, that, thank you. Um, I mean, that speaks to this certain kind of um, culture of fear and insecurity that's pervasive and this sense of that public spaces are places of danger for children. I, I can't be glib about that, although the actual data on this is that the most dangerous places for children are at the home. I mean, most violence done to children is by people who know them. Almost all so-called abductions are by uh, excluded parents or relatives, so that there's actually not much danger to children in the in the open spaces of it, of even the biggest cities. That's where children used to play. I, I had my early childhood in the Bronx, which I, I don't know if that carries across, but it's one of the boroughs of New York City and not the most glamorous of them. And I played outside alone, you know, with other kids. 
If, if everybody, I, and I don't, I, this is one way of saying, I don't have an answer to this, because, but I think it's a bogus problem. And I think the problem is produced around this, this sort of w what people glibly say, the weapons of mass distraction. But I mean, we have 24-7 news. The news has to fixate on things like child abduction or you know, one, one horrible thing happening. And it's not to say horrible things don't happen. But you know, to, I, I have this fantasy of like, OK, everybody let their children outside today and forever after this, and it'll be OK, because then it'll be the sort of old form of Jane Jacobs sort of city, if you've read that, where there's eyes on the street, where the sidewalks are occupied by children and neighbors and, and, and the population. I know that's not happening, though it should. And I think there's something to think about why this cultivation of fear and insecurity and, and, and sense that children are not safe in, in the public wor world. Why the response is then to privatize childhood rather than to have programs in neighborhoods, after school programs, um, Scandinavian-like programs in, within housing areas where kids come, come home after school and there's one adult who kind of oversees just general free play. Back to my, my um, 25 hour work week, which is just a random number. I'm all, I'm all for a less, a little shorter work week. Um, that leaves time for parents and others to be with children or somebody in a community to be not working, a way of, wor of work sharing around childcare that doesn't require privatized nannies. Um, we're talking about the extended, uh, the time space expansion. Where does, where does the caring work come from in the global north? It comes from these very long chains of migration of, of women, for the most part, from the global south, who can often leave their own children behind in the care of extended families to take care of children who don't any longer have the option of living in extended family situations. So I'm not answering the question necessarily, but I'm saying that our, our way of understanding the problem has been to make us retreat further. And it's led to more structuring of childhood, more burdens on parents, not changing the gendered relations of, of household production, more women leaving the workplace to stay home with children, this ideas of intensive parenting as the most important kind of parenting. I just had like looked at the New York Times for one second online this morning, and there was an article about something that I had hoped was a passing thing about um, no diapers, like um, di Diaper free by three was what it was called, but by three months. And so you're so close to your baby that you know when they need to go. And it's one thing if you live in rural Sudan where there's a mud floor uh, and you can pour water on it, clean it up. It's another thing on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, but that's where it's happening. So there's a kind, and that requires intensive mothering, not fathering. And those things are all political. Like, why, why this idea about child care now? Why this, I must not work so that I can take care of my baby without diapers? And they're, they're saying it's an environmental issue, like you're saving trees and water by doing this. This is like why we are in Afghanistan to save women. I wouldn't believe either one of those. <laughs> All right. Um, can we get the person just over back here in the orange shirt? Hi, my name is um, Spencer. I'm a Clarendon Scholar at Oxford. Um, I, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is, to use your terminology, a bit glib to say, but um, I, have I to mean, <laughs> I, 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 Listening to your initial story and listening to the idea of social reproduction, which is a very kind of appealing idea, I immediately had to think of, you know, well, so isn't, so is then what's happening here creative destruction is, you know, destroying social reproduction. And, you know, these, these things just, and we've been talking a lot in this conference about change and about 
you know, how incredibly fast change goes. And, you know, you just use the, the phrase of we're all on the treadmill and, you know, we can't. But it seems to me, and it seems like what a lot of people have been saying is that, you know, there's no real way off of the treadmill. Mm. Um, change is going to happen regardless. Change is going to go really fast. And yet, you know, some of what you're saying, uh, you know, really speaks to me, you know, the kind of imagining creative ways of having a new future, you know, 25 hour work weeks, um, these kind of things. But other things also, you know, seem to have this, what in my mind is a little bit of an uneasy grasping, like the way to cope with this is to go back to the past. Uh -huh. Social reproduction is something that occurred in the past and is something. So, I mean, I guess how do we, you know, cope with this kind of creative destruction in a way, you know, that's not, yeah, it, it start, you know, where do we locate imagining new ways of dealing with change that just keeps going on and on and on? Well, um, okay, that's great. For one, social reproduction is, is dialectically connected to production. It's not something from the past. It's something that is required if production is going to continue, if any social formation is going to continue, there has to be a reproduction of, like I said, a differentiated labor force, a, um, a population is capable of working the means of production, which includes the environment, so that you can't sully, you know, in, in olden, the older forms of reproduction, there was kind of destructive forms of production, much more so than now. So we're not, you know, undestructive, of course, but there was a sense of like, well, we'll just move on. And now, and I want to include the environment in an, any definition of social reproduction. That that is part of what has to be um, maintained and and available for ongoing production. I think you're sensing probably aptly a sort of romance with the past, so the idea of, of a playful kind of free childhood. But, but to say that change is ongoing and inevitable and happens at, is to say that change is, is, is an autonomous process. We produce change. We resist change. It's all socially formed. So there, there's not something called change that exceeds human capacity. It's all about what we do, the choices we make, and, we, and the kinds of ways we understand the challenges we face. So that the challenges of the political economy, the environment, geopolitics right now, often feel just impossible. You know, impossible to, to have some way of engaging that would be meaningful, that would be effective, that would actually um, undo some of the damage or reroute it or get us to this idea of a shorter work week or a, a, a fuller employment. And those, and I, and so I want to question the way, what is that information, where does it come from that makes us feel insecure, that makes us feel like we have to be on these treadmills, that makes us feel like children are in danger, because there are ways that are not, and that's why I said, and social reproduction is precisely not revolutionary. The idea of a shortened work week is not to un undo capitalism, which I would really rather do, but I'm talking to Gates fellows and Rhodes fellows, so <laughs> I'm not one of you. So I'm not, I'm not going to come out with my red flag, but I would like the end of I'm live streaming. <laughs> this is not a secret. I would like capitalism to end. But, I know that's not going to happen in an hour, and I'm not going to happen here. And so what I want is to think about these three R's, this resilience, the reworking, and the resistance. How, do, how would we be collectively more resilient? How would we rework the conditions in which we find ourselves? What could we say about the nature of work, about growing inequality, that would be effective? How do we say to the culture of fear, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to assume that everyone is a terrorist. I'm not going to have a violent response. And to, and to say, 
These limits on production or on who can work or on who gets to um, have a life that's survivable, it requires me to do something different. And that, and that remakes the world in, in the most everyday, mundane, drivelly ways, but also in profound ways. So I hope that makes sense. I, I see the next one. Thank you so much, Cindy Katz, for your insights on social reproduction.